Let's pray. Papa, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you, Father, that you have... <sighs> that you have purpose to stay in your heart, God. That this family here would see you rightly, Jesus. We would not run from the cross, but we would run to the cross, God. Would I pray that you would come and just head just into yourself, God, even in this place. Even as it is so painful to watch and to see, Lord, I pray that it would not just be a revelation on the outside, but a revelation on the inside. All that you endured for our sake, God. All that you endured, Jesus. Lord, I pray that it would mark us in a way that we are forever changed. So, Papa, come. Holy Spirit, we lean into you and not our own understanding. We lean into you, God, to reveal your son this morning. May you truly exalt him and honor him alone. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Whew. So this morning, um, I have the great privilege of speaking on John 19. Um, and to be really, really honest, it was hard. <laughs> it was really hard preparing even just for the message this week. Honestly, all of my flesh wanted to run in the opposite direction. You know, out of all the chapters in John, 19 is the one that I kind of breeze by because it's, it's so intense. It's, it's beyond my comprehension. And to look at the cross, I mean, it's so painful. It is so painful. But I think the thing the Lord kept putting on my heart, that it's, it's really more than a physical pain that Jesus endured. It was so much more than you and I can fully understand, that we need the Holy Spirit to really understand him rightly. But if you would lean into him and not what you think the cross is about, I know that Papa is going to release something powerful in this room. Because you can't look at the cross, see it rightly, and not be changed. When you see the cross, everything, everything changes. The whole Bible is literally cum culminating up into this moment. And it's from eternity past. Revelation says he was the lamb that was slain before the world. Before even the world was formed, Papa knew what he would have to do for us. And he still formed it. Ha! Huh! That, that wrecks me right there. Whew, Jesus. He knew what him and his son would have to endure for our sake. And he still created the world. He still formed us frail, weak human beings. And it was all for the sake of love. Whew. So I know, it's heavy. Trust me, it's heavy. Literally, my body fought against this message. <laughs> like, I had some serious warfare happening. Illness struck me in a way it's never struck me before, where I had physical pain on the inside, even just waiting on this message. It wasn't actually until like 2.22 a.m. yesterday, that the re or this morning actually, the revelation of why it was so painful hit me, literally at 2.22 this morning. <laughs> it hit me. <laughs> I was like, Jesus, why is this so hard for me to speak on the cross? It's because none of us like to be a burden. None of us, especially us Asian kids. We fight so hard to be the good ones, right? You know, this past week, I was privileged to sit with my pastors and my leaders, and Mama Grace just brought all of the pastoral staff together and had us waiting on the Lord together. She was sharing on the revelation that the Lord is saying, in this season, he's doing a new thing. And if he's doing a new thing, that means we need new wineskins. Doesn't matter how many years you have been in ministry, how many years you have walked with the Lord, he is constantly doing a new thing. And if you do not receive through the spirit the new wineskin, you won't be able to have the capacity to carry what he's about to do. So we sat together and trust me, these meetings are rough for me. 
Not because I don't enjoy prayer. I love prayer. And I love getting to pray with our family. But for me, it's especially hard because they pray in a language I literally do not understand. <laughs> They're literally praying in a language I don't get with my physical mind. And I remember kind of wrestling in that place as we're praying and we're contending, we're asking the Lord. Juping constantly the whole time is translating for me, behind me. The whole time, she's just telling me what they're saying. And then this revelation hit me. Because I felt so uncomfortable. I felt so bad. I'm like, I'm such a burden, God. Why am I here? And then this family, I'm such a burden to them. Like, I, hear, I see Papa David, like, squinching his eyes. Because it's weird for him, I'm sure. I don't understand it. But he's hearing the same thing twice in two languages. <laughs> You know, and he's trying to focus so intently. I see him like, uh, like pressing in as I'm sitting next to him. And he doesn't move. He just sits with me. He doesn't move. And Ju Ping behind me, like translating as fast as she can as the Holy Spirit's speaking through different ones as we're praying. And I realized, oh, my family's fought for me to be here. They fought for me to have this place. And for me to understand the burden that they carry in order for me to sit with them helps me to love them. Because I understand what they have to go through for me. It's in this place of utter weakness where I'm fully reliant on them. If they don't translate, I am lost in translation, quite literally. And yet they, they're pressing in for me and they're fighting for me. That's such a tiny glimpse of what Jesus did. We won't understand his life unless we understand his death. And for us as human beings, looking at the face of death is scary. It really, really is, right? Looking at the face of, of the reality that one day I will not be here anymore. Most of us are young people in this room, and we think we're invincible, right? We think we're literally untouchable, that sickness and death can't touch us. But the reality is we've all been born with an expiration date. We're just unaware of it <laughs> most of the time. But unless we go there, unless we understand the reality of death, we cannot understand the power of life. I'm not trying to be morbid, but it's real. I would probably guess rightly that no one in this room enjoys going to funerals, right? Nobody enjoys going to someone that they love's funeral, right? It's probably our worst nightmare, thinking of someone that we love and going to their funeral. The Lord reminded me of this early in the morning at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, I remember it's seven years ago on July 25th this year, seven years ago, um, that someone really important in my life had passed away. And you guys have sh heard me share about her before. This was Esther. Esther was the first person in my life that demonstrated the love of God for me. She loved Jesus so well, and she loved everyone else so well. I remember I was actually at a kind of a training with my youth in Philadelphia when I got the news. Someone had um, called me and told me that she passed. And I really, I couldn't even think about it. I was like, I can't, I can't think about her passing away. I got to get through this mission trip and this training and like get through this week. But finally, the day came of her funeral. And I remember me, a really good friend, we stood outside of those doors and we couldn't go in. Like it was so hard. Because for me, I didn't want my last memory of Esther to be this body in a coffin. I didn't want to remember her as this lifeless thing. I remember standing outside those doors and just us just trying to help each other to get through. We have to go. We knew, we knew that we would not be OK if we didn't go, but there was just this struggle to go see. And I remember finally we, we, we got enough courage after hours, I think, in the parking lot. I mean, the, the whole thing it was almost over. We were sitting in the parking lot just crying and remembering, but also just mourning this beautiful life that wasn't with us anymore. And you know, the craziest thing happened. So as we walked and I, and I, I came to 
the coffin where Esther was laid to rest. Something got released that I can't really fully understand. All of a sudden, I heard Holy Spirit say, that's not her. She's with me. As I looked at her body, I realized it was just a tent. It wasn't her home. That Esther was home. So when I looked at her, it made me realize this gift of life that we have, that we are all like tents temporarily. But this is not our home. This is not our home. So I want to encourage you guys to look at the cross this morning with new eyes. New eyes. That it will reveal to you guys who we really are by looking at Jesus and who he really is. The Lord reminded me of, of Genesis 22. It was Abraham and Isaac. And Abraham calling, um, the Lord calling to Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And throughout the whole story, you know, Abraham at this point is a really old man, like super old. I mean, over a century old. That's old. And the Lord calls him to sacrifice his teenage son. He was a teenager, guys, most likely around 12 or 13 years old. And so can you imagine Abraham walking with Isaac? And him going through this process and God calling to him to sacrifice the most important thing in his life, his dream, his dream, which was to have a son. And so he walks with his dream and recognizes all through that while, I got to trust. At some point, Isaac realizes they got the wood, they got the stuff to make the fire, Where's the sacrifice? But I'm sure when he's asking, he kind of already knows. So he asks his papa, where's the sacrifice? And I love his response. Papa will provide the sacrifice. Father, God's going to provide the sacrifice. Fast forward, you know that there, as he's getting ready to sacrifice his own son, the Lord brings a ram, which is a mature sacrifice. For us, we've all tried to be like Abraham and do this thing on our own. But when we look at the cross, we realize Papa prepared the sacrifice for you and for me. That Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. I know this is super heavy, but if you would give yourself to understanding this in a new way, I know that Papa wants to release new life. You cannot live until you die. Paul said it the best, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because I get to go home and be with Christ. So either way, it's so good. So as we look at the cross this morning, um, I just want to give you a little bit of just context and history so that you can kind of understand it rightly. But I feel like this is a really good time to pray. <laughs> it feels heavy in the room, but it's so good. I, I want you to lean in. I, I know that our flesh wants to run, but I want you to lean in. So Papa, Lord, give us the grace to lean in. Help our flesh to be subdued. Lord, we're choosing to gaze upon the cross, to look upon your death and your sacrifice, God. Help us to see you rightly, Jesus. Help us to see you rightly, Jesus. I pray the scales of our eyes be removed, the hardness of our hearts softened. Lord, let it melt. Let it melt in the arms of love. Let our hearts melt. We really don't know what the cross is about. We really don't know. So Papa, would you help us this morning? Because we want to know your heart. We want to know your heart. Thank you, Jesus. 
Amen. Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Becoming a curse for us, it is written, curse is everyone who is hung on a tree. The reality is Jesus took upon himself not just a literal cross to bear. You know, these crosses were not light things. They were actually, historically, they were like 300 pounds in weight. He literally carried our body weight. Most of us is covered under the 300 mark to the cross. But it, it is so much more than that. You know, John explains and reveals the cross in such a way where it's, it's more than just, it's more than just emotion and feeling. Do you get me? I mean, to look at that much suffering, to look at the face of suffering like that, I mean, you would have to be the hardest person to not be moved to the reality of that person being in so much pain. Like literally, those cat of nine tails that his body was ripped up in was covered in, in shards of broken glass and metal. And every lash he took upon his body is every sickness that plagues this earth. But it, it's so much more than the physical pain that Jesus endured. There's so much going on in the spiritual realm that we don't really have the understanding to fully get. But this is the reality, he became a curse. And upon himself, he took my hell. He took your hell. Your eternity spent, and he spent six hours living on it on the cross. Every single person in this room, our eternity in hell was put on his body. I want that to sink in. That's pretty heavy. You don't have to spend forever without Jesus and without Papa God because he endured it on that cross. And even just seeing the process of him getting there, because it's a process. You know, our Jesus, our beautiful Savior, he was led like an animal. Did you know that? When they crucified people, it was common tradition that they would tie a rope around their neck and the soldiers would lead them like an animal. And when we're just looking at the outside as these soldiers are acting like this is just another crucifixion on their watch, there's just so much more happening. Because he was not, Jesus was not the victim here. He was not the victim here. Do you hear me? He was not a victim to the soldiers and to persecution. He was the willing participant. He's the one that said yes. He's the one in the garden who realized, I mean, he's fully man, guys. He's fully human. He feels as much as we feel. And he knew what he was about to endure. Literally, he started sweating blood when he thought about the thing that he was about to endure, our eternities in hell on the cross, every single one of us. He was about to put that on his own body. And as, as, as you see his humanity in that garden, he said, God, would you let this cup pass for me? He asked, Papa, would you let it pass? But not my will be done, but yours. And then he said, but for the joy, for the joy set before me. Do you get that? Do you get that you were his joy? Even as his body was being pierced, even as these things were happening to his physical body, so much more was happening to his spiritual body. We can't fathom. And yet he said, you are my joy. You are my joy. You are my joy.
it's a sobering reality, right? I know Jesus, if he could endure it all again just for one person in this room, knowing him, he would. And forever, the beautiful thing, you know, when Thomas got to see his resurrected body, I can't wait to see Jesus' resurrected body because it's so beautiful. I've gotten to see glimpses of it in the spirit. Jesus has literally walked into the room before, and it's beautiful. But I haven't gotten to actually be like Thomas and put my hands there. You know, forever he will bear the scars of what he bore. But these are not scars of, of humil humiliation. These are not the scars of shame. They are the scars of victory. They are the scars for victory. Forever he will keep those scars. I hope that you could let that sink in. You are his joy. You are his joy. You are his joy. You know, these, these uh, poor soldiers had no idea what they were doing. I think that's why Jesus said to them, this is, this is the thing that amazes me. While he's enduring the cross, he's still fighting for us. Can you imagine that? The weight of everyone's sin, everyone's eternity in hell, on his body, his spirit, his soul, this crushing thing, and yet he still cares about every single person around him. He cares for the thief who is dying next to his side, and he gives him hope and says, you will be with me in paradise. He looks at these soldiers that are just going about their business, and they're missing him completely, and he says to them, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. See, as these men are gambling away, they think that they're just doing what they do as soldiers, right? The spoils of war and that they're the victors right now. That they get the better end of the deal than the guy on the cross. They fail to realize that Papa's been in control this whole time. That's why John speaks of the scripture that is fulfilled, the prophecy that happened thousands of years ago that said that this would happen the way that it would. That they would gamble for his own clothes. All throughout this whole process in John 19, you see a father that's fully in control. Fathers in this room know it is unimaginable to be able to think that you're fully in control of seeing your son suffer. You're fully in control of making it stop. But for the sake of those who don't even want you, you're going to let him endure it. Can you imagine that? I know I'm not letting up, but I want this to hit so hard on the inside because we make Christianity about so many other things. We make it about program. We make it about being good. We make it about doing things, but really it is only about Jesus, him crucified, and his life released. If we would get this, literally everything changes everything changes, then the offense that keeps us like walls of hostility in this room fall. Because you can't look at the cross and be offended at the person next to you. You can't. Every illness and disease in this room would be completely healed. Because you see every weightiness of sin and brokenness of our bodies on his body on his body. Are you guys getting this family? Let it not sit here. Let it come in here. Let it wreck you and ruin you. Don't try to hold it all together. Trust me, it doesn't work. It never does. When we try to hold it together, one way or another, we all get swept away. It's like a whirlwind. But the foundation that never shakes is the rock. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock. And he established everything on the cross. Everything. Whew, hallelujah. Wow. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa.
Thank you, Papa. Only in John do we see it recorded because John was the only disciple in that place. He was the one that watched it all. Saw Jesus' body broken. Watched him carry that cross. And watched him lift up his life and lay it down. It was only in John that we see it recorded when Jesus speaks to him. And you might think this is an odd thing, but it just reveals so much more, as I was saying, how Jesus cared for us. Even as his body was being weighed down with the curses of humanity, he still cared for the ones that he loved. He cared so well. He looked at his mom. You know, his mom never speaks. You don't hear it recorded in history ever, her speaking again. Um, but I just can't imagine watching my own son being tortured in front of me. I think she probably remembered Simeon's prophecy that this is the one that's going to change it and turn it all around. I think he remembered, she remembered when the angel came and remembered what she was saying yes to. And she stood by her son as he fulfilled her, his calling. Some of us older generation in this room, it's hard to keep saying yes to the Lord because it really is this dying process. The mothers and fathers in the house, many of us have our own dreams. But I feel even his invitation of us seeing, maybe our greatest dream is seeing the next generation's dreams come true. And in that place, ours does too. But Mary was there. And his beloved disciple was there. And the way that he speaks to John and to Mary, John, this is your mother. Mary, this is your son. He took care of business, <laughs> even on the cross. He cared for the people in his family. How many of us, when we're struggling, even remotely see the person next to us who's struggling just as much? Sometimes we put our suffering in the forefront, that it's all we see. But even in this place where Jesus is enduring the cross, he thought about his mother's suffering. He thought about John's suffering. And he released comfort and love in that place. That is what is found on the cross. Not our comfy bubble of what we know and what we think. All that gets popped. It's like nails. <laughs> what we see in the cross is sacrifice and love. What we see on the cross is death that brings life. What we see is the resurrection power, but it came only onto a sacrifice. How many of us want the power and the resurrection, but we don't want the death? We don't want the suffering. But Jesus said, if you don't suffer, you're not my disciple. There is coming a day, soon and very soon, where us gathering here would be seen as a hate crime. Do you know that? You don't need to be a prophet to know that. There's coming a day where we're not going to be allowed to worship or even say his name. Do you guys realize that? Because the cross is offensive. His name is offensive because it bucks against all of our flesh and pride and understanding. There's a coming a day soon and very soon where us even talking about him, we would be flogged. We would be put in jail. We'd be tortured. I wouldn't be a good shepherd if I didn't prepare you for that. And the only way I know how to prepare you for that is the cross. 
it is the cross. To realize what has been suffered for our sake. That's why Paul, oh, Paul, <laughs> he could do what he did. You know what's amazing to me? Paul was a disciple that did not see or even see Jesus in the physical, really. He might have been around. I don't know if he, his path ever crossed Jesus, honestly. It did cross Stephen, and you saw what happened there. He never saw Jesus, but he had such an encounter with the cross. You remember the road to Damascus? Where Paul was ready to persecute all those Christians. He was ready to put them in jail and flog their bodies. He was so ready. He thought he was the high and righteous one doing the will of God. And Jesus appears before him and says, Paul, why do you persecute me? Why are you hurting me? You hurt those that I love, you're hurting me. And man, I mean, his eyes were blinded. But really, his eyes were blinded before. He just didn't know it. <laughs> when he got the revelation of Jesus and his suffering and all that Jesus endured, this man literally changed the world. He went to more nations than I don't even know. I've, he went to more nations than I've ever been. <laughs> And everywhere he went, the gospel, Jesus crucified, was preached. And everywhere where the gospel and Jesus was preached without compromise, there was power and transformation released. Papa's doing a new thing on this earth. He wants us to have a new wineskin for us to receive it. We need to see his son rightly. Mark 2.22. It talks about that. 2.22. Two, two, two. <laughs> it's my number, but the Lord is saying it's your number. God's calling us out, family. It's our time. Your number's being called, and he's calling you out. It's not safe Christianity anymore. You can't hide behind these church walls and think somehow you're going to be protected and preserved. He says, I call you out. You must go. You must go. You know I say it all the time, the quickest way to be filled is if you pour out. But more than that, he, us staying sheltered in this place, it's not going to do much. But watch your spirit die. <laughs> I'm just being real. Because if you're not where he is, your spirit dies. <laughs> if you're not where his presence is, if you're not where his heart is, if you're not being obedient, then the Holy Spirit flies. That's why he's like the dove, right? It takes a heart of obedience, of saying yes, of not staying in the safety. He's calling us out, family. He wants us to have a new wine, a new paradigm shift, and it starts with us seeing the cross. Are you guys getting it this morning? I hope so. I see a few. I'm praying for the whole room. I'm especially speaking to the youth in this room. I'm not gonna talk down to you and I'm not gonna dumb down the gospel. Because the reality is you are mature in Christ. There's a whole Holy Spirit in you. Not a tiny Holy Spirit. You have the whole Holy Spirit. And believing if your generation gets the revelation of the cross, everything will change. You hearing me? Give me a nod. Yeah? Yes? Yes? My beautiful junior high girls, do you guys know what the powerhouse of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you and is deposited there because Jesus died and endured the cross? He said it was better for us that he would go, that you may have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So now you get to do the greater things, you and I. Oh, Papa, how are we going to end this? I don't even know. <laughs> Whew. Worship team, can you help me just go on up? Sure. 
it was really funny, you know, this morning. I got up super early. I was like up like early this morning and then just waiting on the Lord. And I got everything ready. I had all my stuff. And then I left my house. I thought I did everything right. Like I fed Shopagyo, my little cute little aminal. I went to go pick up my friend who was here interceding on my behalf and covering me. We got here super early and I was like, oh, Jesus, yes, I'm all ready to go. I'm all ready to go. And I realized as I'm looking through my stuff, I forgot my laptop. <laughs> and all my notes, which I did not save, like in other places, were there. Praise the Lord for an awesome roommate that sent me my notes like via email. But even in not having it, the Lord said, I can't rely on anything else. I can't lean on my own understanding. I spent this whole week diving into John 19, and I, I feel like I only barely even scratched the surface of understanding the cross. And in that place of my lacking, I was like, Holy Spirit, you got to come. Because really, that's the only way we get that revelation on the inside. So if you need a fresh revelation of the cross this morning, I just want to invite you to come. That's the simple call. You need a fresh revelation of who Jesus is and the cross and all that he suffered, all that he endured, more than physical pain, more than mere sentiment, the reality, the reality of what was laid upon our beautiful Jesus. That the reality of my eternity spent in torture and damnation was put on his body. Your hell, my hell, every single person was put on that beautiful body. And then he called it a joy. I just want to invite you to stand. I want you to invite you to come forward just to encounter him and let Holy Spirit do what only he can do. Give you a fresh revelation of the cross this morning to break the boxes we've put him in, to break our old mindsets of doing things in our own strength. We want to see you rightly, Jesus. We want to see you rightly, Jesus. We want to see you rightly, Jesus. The lamb who was slain for the foundations of the earth. Help us to see you rightly, Jesus.